he really was on top of the whole world. He was on top of the world. This guy was known for his integrity. He was known for his ability to lead. And he was pretty much living the life. But he was about to make a decision that would change his life forever. He was about to make one decision that would completely wreck the rest of his legacy and everything that would come after that. You guys know the story. It's the story of King David. David was supposed to be out at war, and yet he was at home one day, out on a balcony. And as he was looking out from his balcony, he saw a woman who was bathing, which was typical in his time period. It wasn't um, unusual for people to bathe on their roofs. That's just kind of what they did in their culture. But rather than turning away, he continued to look at her. And although he was married, and although she was married, he decided that he wanted to take her and sleep with her. So he did. He told his, his guards, go get her for me. And they did. And they slept together. And I'm sure he thought it was what it was. It was just, you know, it ha things happen. A month goes by, two months goes by, and suddenly he gets news that she has not had her period. She's pregnant. So he has a problem on his hands now. He doesn't know what to do, but like many of us, maybe, he decides, I'm going to cover it up. There's no way I'm going to, like, you know, come out on this and just say, hey, man, I, I screwed up. I, I have a wife. He has, she has a husband. We can't do this. So here's what his decision is. Her husband is out at war. He says, let's bring him home, and let's have them sleep together, and maybe the whole problem will go away. So he does. He brings the guy home and says, hey, uh, why don't you go have a good time with your wife? You know, enjoy yourself. And her, the husband says, you know what? It's really nice of you, King, to bring me home like this. But while all of my guys are out at war, I, they're sleeping in tents. It wouldn't be right for me to, you know, be with my wife in our home. And when the king goes out that night, he's on the porch, not inside the house. So his plan's not going to work. So the next night, he's thinking, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? And here's literally what this king does. He's, this is the king of God's people. This is a big deal, all right? He literally just starts handing the guy drinks, handing the guy drinks, handing the guy drinks, handing the guy drinks. He gets them plastered, all right? And so now this guy has, like, beer goggles on, all right? This guy's completely faded out of his mind. And uh, the king, you know, says, go on home, thinking, okay, you know, it's going to be good, right? But the guy stays up talking to his buddies. And no, I'm not going to go home because all my boys are out at war. How can I go home and stay with my wife? And you kind of get this sense like, wait a minute, who is the intoxicated one here? Is it the guy who's drunk out of his mind or the king who's doing everything he can to cover up his sin because he can't see himself and his life going down that direction of honestly admitting what he's done wrong? And so finally, the king writes out a letter, and the letter says this. It says, I want you to, it's, it's addressed to the general, and it says, I want you to go to the hottest part of the battle, where it's basically a suicide mission. I want you to all charge the gates, and then when everyone is about to, when they're about to attack us, I want everyone to retreat except for this guy. Don't tell him. And here's the thing about the integrity of this man. His name is Uriah. David writes the letter, seals it up, hands it to him, and this guy doesn't even realize that he's about to deliver his own death note to the general. That's exactly what he does. The general opens it up. The general listens to the king. You begin to see how many people are complicit in David's sin. The commanders who went and grabbed, the guards who grabbed, you know, this woman, the, the other guys who, who conspired with David to murder this guy. And guess what? The plan works perfectly. They go to war. They charge. Everyone retreats. No one tells him he falls dead. And now the problem is solved. And now news gets out. She's pregnant. And now David gets to say to everyone, don't worry. I'll raise this child like my own. I'll take care of this widow. And everyone gets to look at King David and say, what a good guy. Taking care of a child that's not his own. Bringing in a woman who's not his own. What a good man. And here's the thing. No one knows about his sin. No one sees his sin. David would have gotten away with his sin. Except... There's never been a sin in the history of the world that wasn't committed with some eyes seeing that sin. And those eyes belong to God. God saw. God saw. And when God sees you in sin, if God loves you, he'll send a prophet your way. 
He'll send someone who has the word of God to speak to you. So he does, because God loves David. God sends a man named Nathan, and Nathan goes to David, and Nathan says, I'm from God, and I have a story to tell you about someone in your kingdom. And David says, go, tell me. He says, well, the thing is, there was this man who had everything. He had everything. He was wealthy, well-liked, popular. He had cattle and a big land, and he was just had so much. And someone came to visit this man who was a foreigner. And this man decided to be hospitable and let him into his house. But when dinner time came, rather than slaughtering one of his own cattle, he looked over at his poor little neighbor. And all his poor little neighbor had was one little sheep that he loved. Little, little, you know, little sheep that he loved like a daughter. He would hold it to his chest. He loved, that's all he owned to his possessions. And this rich, wealthy farmer, rather than slaughtering one of his own cattle, decided to go into his neighbor's yard, take what was his, kill what wasn't his, and then give it as food to this foreigner to provide for him dinner. Because he wanted to look good in the eyes of the community and the eyes of this guy. And so then the prophet asks, what do you think about that, King David? And King David is furious, hot. King David says, that man deserves to die. The evil he's done, taking what wasn't his, Never being content. He says, in fact, not only does he deserve the death penalty, he should pay that family back four times what he stole. That's what we're going to do. That's the plan. Because that was wicked. And it's at that moment that David doesn't even realize he just signed, sealed, delivered his own destiny. It's at that moment the prophet looks at him and the prophet says these devastating words. He says, David, you're that man. You're the man. You're the man. And David starts to realize that this wasn't a story about someone else. This is a story about himself. That he was the one who had so much and wasn't content and took what wasn't his and killed what he should not have killed so that he could look good in the eyes of others. And it was him. It's at that moment that David breaks down and begins to realize God saw his sin. God sent a prophet, and the prophet is here to tell him, you so easily see sin when other people wear it, but you can't even see it in your own lives. See, when David heard the story, he said, that's sin, but David could not see it in his own life. David is so broken over his own self-righteousness, over his blindness to how wicked he's been. David writes one of the most beautiful um, poems in the history of the world, Psalm 51. It's a poem of brokenness to God. And in this poem, he writes, God, I, I, I would do anything to make you happy with me. I, I would bring the best sacrifice in the world to church if I could. I'll do whatever, he says, but I know the sacrifices that count is a broken and contrite heart. He says, at the end of the day, you don't want me to be impressive and give lots of money. You don't want me to do a big show for you. You don't want me to to make it about me. At the end of the day, God, what you would want most in this situation where I find myself broken and, and having no integrity and impoverished spiritually, what you want is my brokenness over my sin Because I didn't see it before. I didn't see it before. But once you told me the story, I saw it clearly when I heard it from another person's story. So often in our lives, we see sin when other people wear it. But we don't see sin when we're wearing it as well. And Chapter 2, verse 1 starts off by saying, Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For when you pass judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, do the very same things. See, what Paul is doing is kind of like what the prophet was doing to King David. He's kind of setting us up. Because the Jews of this day, if you would have asked a Jew, hey, Who do you think are the worst sinners? The Jews would have looked at the pagans who didn't have the Bible, who didn't know God. And the Jews would have said, oh, it's the Gentiles. It's the Greeks. It's those pagans, those people out there. They're the bad ones. We're the good ones. That's why God loves us, because we're the good ones, remember? And, and, And so the Jews thought, of course, those people are bad. And, and Paul has kind of been agreeing with them so far. 
Paul starts off his letter in Romans chapter 1, 16, saying the good news of Jesus is for the Jew and for the Greek. And then Paul says, and here's the thing. You know, people are, we're all messed up. And he starts off by talking about um, the pagans, the outsiders, the Greeks, the Gentiles, the people who had tons of idols, who worshiped false gods. We might call these people the rebellious sinners, all right? And he says, you know those guys who are always um, doing like, like, like really rotten things in, in their sex lives and those guys who are ruthless and faithless and heartless and just really bad people, right? You guys know them and you can imagine the Jewish reader going, yeah, I know those guys. My pagan neighbors are the worst. They play loud music and always having to call the cops. I don't know if they have cops in. They probably don't have phones in. You know, you know, he's like, you know, he's just going like, these are, yeah, I know those pagans. They're the bad guys. And Paul says, well, I got to tell you, man, they really deserve the judgment of God, those rebel sinners. And you can imagine the Jewish reader going, yeah, 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 yeah. And now Paul says, gotcha. When you judge another person and yet do the same things that they do, you're actually bringing judgment on yourself because there's not actually only one way to rebel against God. I know many of us think that there's actually only one way to rebel against God, but the truth is there are two fundamental types of sinners. There's the rebellious sinner, the person who grows up with no Bible, no uh, desire to love God, living la vida loca, right? They're doing them every day, all day, whenever they want. And this person, maybe they wear their sin and it's quite obvious to everyone, they have no reference for God, okay? And it's easy to look at them and say, oh yeah, they, they don't care about God. And so when you think, well, God's judgment's on them, you think, oh yeah, that probably makes sense because look at how they live, right? But here is the thing that's really disorienting for religious, moral church people is the Bible introduces another category that kind of shocks us. It says there's not only the rebellious sinner, there's also what we might call the religious sinner. There's not only the paganism, but the moralism. Both are an affront to God because both reject God. See, the people who don't grow up with the word of God, who don't come to church, who don't know God's word, who don't obey God's word, God has still made himself known to them. In chapter 1, it says God has made himself known through creation. The very fact that they were made by God, the Bible says they have image of God value. The Bible says that they are his and he made them. The fact that they are part of his creation, they should know God. But chapter 1, we saw they suppress the truth. They exchange the truth for a lie. They exchange the creator God to worship creation. That They exchange right for wrong. So we see all these distortions of the way they live their lives. And the Bible would call, we, some theologians call that general revelation. And what it means is that everyone in all places all the time have access to who God is through his created world. That even the person who's in the world's remote parts of the world knows that there's a creator you may not know his name, right? You don't like walk down the road and say, oh, that rock. There's a man named Jesus Christ who died for my sins. Like that's not what I'm saying. You don't know specific content. But you know, hey, things don't come out of nothing. So someone must have created everything. And it couldn't be a natural thing that created everything because it has to be supernatural. So, okay, that's probably a God. Like you should know that. And yet, people wanting to suppress that truth do and they reject God as their creator. That's called the rebel sinner. They reject the revelation that's general that God has given them. But the Bible says there are other people who grow up in the church, grow up going to, to, to have sacred texts and, and read and discipline themselves and do what they're supposed to do. They're very religious. They're very moral. They're very good. On the outside, you look at them and they're doing all the right things. That's the person you want as your neighbor. And the Bible says, guess what? They are in the same boat because they judge other people. And even worse than those other people, they not only judge them, but they go and do it themselves. This is what I call the religious sinner, the moralist. See, they don't reject God as their creator. They reject God as their savior. The reason why it's so, it's so offensive to God is because the person who has this inclination, what they're doing is they're saying to God, I want to earn it my way. Like, like the pagan like rebel says, I, I, I want to live it my way. But, but the religious moralist says, I want to earn it my way. God, I'm going to put you in my debt. Look how good of a person I am. I'm going to be so good that you're going to owe me heaven. 
No, no, even more than that. I'm gonna be such a good person. You're gonna owe me a good life. And so when suffering comes, they're like, hey, God, what gives? I did my part. Why didn't you do your part? And they try to put God in their debt through their actions. And the reality is, each and every one of us needs to hear that that is just another way of rejecting God. Because God will not operate on those terms. So, our big idea today is this. God judges judgmental hypocrites as much as he does the radical rebels. That's true. That if you judge others and do the same things, God is judging you the way you're judging others. That your judgment is actually bringing judgment on yourself because look at me, friends. Look at me. Hey, this isn't actually about David, is it? When I say you're the man, that's actually not a story about David, is it? And it's not even a story about the Jews of the first century, is it? No, friends, it's not even about other churches, Gateway. And, and here's the crazy part. Some of you have been like, man, I, I wish my cousin was here in this sermon. It's not even about your cousin, right? Like, you don't get it if you're like, yeah, you're right. My cousin needs to hear this, you know? Like, bro, you're the man. You're like, who, my cousin? No, you, bro, you. Like, that's the thing. Like, it's, it's actually every one of us in this room who I'm talking to. So w- why don't we do this? Just for 10 seconds. Why don't you pray a little prayer in your heart right now? Why don't you say, God, let me hear this sermon for me. Go ahead and pray that quietly. Amen. All right. See, the Bible tells us that there are different types of sinners, but um, the reality is if you're more inclined towards the rebel life or the religious life, that if you are not living a life that is trusting in Jesus and honoring him as Lord, that you're actually dishonoring God and that there's judgment for that. Whether you're the paganist or the moralist, the rebel or the religious, the reality is God will judge the the judgmental hypocrite because they do the same things. Look at verse 2. We know that God's judgment falls on those people who practice these things. Do you think that you who judge those who practice these things and yet do do them yourself will escape the judgment of God? Again, the Jew hearing this is like, wait, what? You're trying to put me on the same level as those pagans? Look how bad they are. Like, like, like pedophilia was like par for the culture in this um, time period. Like if you were a successful businessman and you had a teen boy, he was a sex toy in culture. No kidding. That's how corrupt that time period was. People just expected it, right? That's why Paul in the last chapter kind of goes really into some of the sexual sin because it's a perverse culture. I know most of us think like, man, I wish I'd go back to like the 50s when like leave it to beaver days or whatever, right? But the reality is sin's always been here. Even 2,000 years ago, people were doing really nasty things. And so the truth is like sin is sin and sin's always been sin. And so the Jews kind of thought like we're pretty good. Like, like we believe in like, like, like marriage and like we, we, go to, we go to, you know, our, our religious space every week. And like we're pretty good. And Paul's devastating them by saying, no, God will judge the judgmental hypocrites. In some ways, you are worse than them because you know better and still do what they do. You know more, right? And not only that, but you judge and then do it, right? Um, again, this is like, like kind of like, uh, I grew up in the church. I grew up very um, religious and moral. So this is like a, a clear kind of example. Um, I, I remember... Um, in my high school, there was this kid who was, he, he was gay, and, um, you know, I didn't have a good spirit towards him. That's the truth. I was really judgmental and critical, partially because he kind of annoyed me, but partially because I think uh, I was just really judgmental. I was a judgmental hypocrite. I had a God who taught me to love people and share Jesus with them and pray for people, but most of me just felt turned off by this guy. And it wasn't until college where the Lord just smashed my pride. Because when I look back at that season, I realized that most of my high school life, um, I was immersed in pornography. And no one knew that, right? But I somehow saw his sin as way worse than my sin. Like it was devastatingly clear the hypocrisy that I could judge someone for their sin and not see my sin as an affront to God as well. And so we do this kind of stuff all the time. And in college, I began to realize like, I never prayed for this guy's salvation. I didn't even like think about this guy as like a person made in God's image and having value. I mostly just thought, man, this guy's annoying. I don't like him, you know? And I thought that I was righteous in doing that. 
but really I was exposing how low and unrighteous I am. Because how can I expect to escape God's judgment when I'm judging other people and doing the same thing? See, the, the thing about it is it may not be the very same manifestation of sin, but the seed form of the sin is, is, is all that matters. Like Jesus talked to some guys and said, hey, you know how uh, you heard don't murder? Yeah, yeah. He says, I say don't hate, don't hate. Because hate is the seed form of murder, right? So, so again, like in the church, it's super easy sometimes. We're very harsh when we talk about things like abortion. And I understand why. I get it, right? Um, but like, have you ever cut someone off and flipped someone off? Seed form, same sin. You might say, well, they're different. I get it. They're different. I'm not trying to say they're equal. But I'm saying Jesus would say, well, that's kind of the same thing. Like hate equals murder in Jesus' eyes. And to break one part of God's eyes, to break it all, Right? I'm, again, I'm not trying to morally equivalent here. I'm just simply saying, if we're following Jesus' words, that the seed form is the same sin. So why do we judge other people without compassion and understanding their stories and loving them and giving them mercy and grace? Why aren't we a space where God can intervene in people's lives like that? Why do we turn the tables and not see our own sin? Why do we not come to them as sinners who've been saved by grace? Or, or uh, again, um, Jesus said, you know, some of you, you've heard the Bible says don't commit adultery. Great. I say don't even lust. So it's easy to look at someone who committed adultery and be like, how could you do that? And, and I think Jesus, part of what he would say to you is, well, have you ever looked at someone and objectified them? Made them a soulless object for your fantasy world? Yeah, yeah. You've checked someone out before, right? He says, that's kind of the same thing in seed form. You let it grow, it comes into this. The, the point I'm trying to say is, when, when, when Paul says, how are you going to judge other people? When you do those same things, we, we, need to, we, we need to check yourself before you wreck yourself. You know what I mean? Like you need to like check your heart before you look out and judge others because the reality is many of us are inclined to those same kinds of things. And, and when you're doing this, here's what the Bible would say, verse 4, you are presuming on the riches of God's kindness, on his forbearance, on his patience, not knowing that God's kindness is supposed to lead you to repentance. In other words, some of us think, okay, that uh, we've gotten away with our sin. We're like, hey, yo, I think God believes the lie. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, he sees me performing out here. I think he didn't see what I did last Saturday. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's weird. We're presuming that because God has been patient that he's dumb or he doesn't see what we're doing. The Bible says, no, don't assume God doesn't see it. Assume that he sees it with clarity. He's just kind. Don't assume that the reason that your sins haven't caught up to you is because God didn't see it, but assume that he's just patiently hoping that you'll realize one day, what am I doing with my life? I know better than this. And you'll turn to him. Don't assume that God is just going to say, oh, you know what? You're my boy, so I'm going to let you go on your sin. Like, I'm just going to overlook it. Because that's what the Jews thought. The Jews thought, well, we're chosen. Well, God chose us. Probably because we're pretty awesome. And Deuteronomy 7 says, no, God chose you not because you're great, because he's great. And so for the church to have this sort of moral pride over how great and chosen we are, entitled we are, is, is the exact opposite of what God actually wants to produce in us. Friends, we should be known as the most humble people, humbled to the dirt, because we know the God who was humbled to the grave. We should be known as the most the most welcoming accessible people for all sinners because we know ourselves with clarity and we know with piercing clarity how Christ was pierced for us. See, we should look at all of the, the grace that we've received in our lives, all of that kindness and say, that's supposed to help me transform my life, not keep taking advantage of it. That's supposed to change the way I interact with God and people. His kindness is supposed to lead me to repentance. Now, the crazy thing is, is some of us have this idea about God that he's angry. And so we need to repent to make him nice. In other words, you think your kindness leads God to his repentance. That God's all angry up there. So you go up to God and say, God, please forgive me. And God's like, all right. And then God repents and becomes nice. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says God starts as kind. It's his kindness leads to our repentance so if you come to a God who is angry, you're not coming to the one true God because the one true God is love. Now, he does get angry at sin, of course. There's wrath poured out. But, but the thing is, the thing that motivates him to move towards you is love, right? While you are still a sinner, Christ died for you. That's love. 
You don't, you don't have to make God love you. That's not the gospel. The gospel is God does love you. He's moved towards you. And let that kindness sit in your heart till it produces a, oh my gosh, I want to transform every part of my life if that's the real truth. Because his kindness is what leads to repentance. Not our kindness that leads to his repentance. It, it, it's not our, our actions, right? It's his rescue that brings repentance. It's his initiative. It's he, the one who does the first step. So... so Let's not take advantage of that mercy, right? Let's not take advantage of that grace. Let's not assume and presume that we deserve it, that we're entitled to it, that we're superior and morally better because the reality is it should humble us, not make us proud and arrogant. There is a guy who went to church once and Jesus saw him and literally one of the guys is so broken over a sinner, all he can do the whole church service is beat his chest and cry, have mercy on me, God, I'm such a sinner. As he can't even lift his eyes. And there's another guy who's a Pharisee, who has it together, who's moral, who's religious, who knows the Bible better than you or I. Seriously, memorize large portions of the Bible. And he's looking at this guy at church. He says, let me pray. I thank you, God, that I'm not like that guy. That's his prayer to God. And Jesus said, I'll tell you what, one of those guys went home with a relationship with God. One of those guys went home right with God. One of those guys gets it. And it's not the guy with the religious degrees. It's not the guy who goes to church. It's not the guy who gets, it's the guy who can't even bear to lift his head because he realizes the crushing weight of his own guilt and sin before a holy God. And he's come with only brokenness to offer. The guy who can't even lift his eyes to see the sins of his neighbors. That's the guy who walks away with the right relationship with God. And all he can see is how great his sin is and how holy God is. And therefore, how gracious it is that God would initiate a relationship with him. Friends, do you have that posture week in and week out? Or are you mostly distracted by how, oh, this isn't the way I like it? Or, oh, you know what? I wish my neighbor was here. Or my wife and I are th Do you come each and every week saying, man, I'm a sinner who needs to hear of a Savior who loves me and transformed me? See, when we begin to become a people who are moralistic, what I mean by that is we only care about outside behaviors and actions and don't realize our own sins, we create a culture that's really, really anti-gospel. We may preach the gospel with our doctrine, but our culture becomes anti-gospel. So our deeds, they, they preach a different gospel than our words. Let me give you some examples. If you go to a church and you feel burdened, I would argue you're probably not going to a gospel-centered church because Jesus comes to say, my yoke is light. My yoke is, I came to lift burdens, not add them. The Pharisees add burdens. Jesus lifts them. So if people are adding burdens, adding burdens, adding burdens, and never lifting burdens, and maybe you haven't encountered Christ. Let's not become a burdening culture where people are burdened to do things that they don't even do themselves. Let's not become a measuring culture. Well, what I mean is sometimes in religious circles, we look at other people, and that's how we judge how good we are. We look at someone and say, hey, I'm better than that dude, so okay, I'm proud. And we look at that, I'm not as good as that dude, so I'm a failure. That's measuring culture. No, the only reason to look at our brothers and sisters is to celebrate with those who are celebrating, weep with those who are weeping, and pray and rejoice and hope together to become the sort of people who God wants us to be. We're not supposed to be measuring ourselves ever in a church context. That destroys contentment. Another problem in, in these kinds of cultures is they become very entitled cultures. You feel owed your own preferences. You feel owed an easy life. So suffering comes and you think, I did it the right way. Why don't I get the life I was promised? And that's because that life was never promised. Think about it. Your Savior died on a cross. So if you're doing it right, you may end up on a cross, right? But the entitlement culture of our generation says, I'm going to put God in my debt with all my good deeds, so he has to give me what I want, heaven and a good life now. What about this? You ever been in a church where it's a performative culture, where it's all about performance? You have to pretend to fit in. There's a mold. And rather than being honest about your need and brokenness, you have to put a mask on and pretend like hey, this is what we do here at church, right? Or maybe it's a restrictive culture where, where there's only one way of doing things, one way of thinking about things. It's very narrow and monolithic, and, and there's, no, there's no diversity. Everyone has to be uniformed. 
right? We want unity in our church. We don't want uniformity in our church. Or maybe it's the maximization culture where, where you just feel the sense that if you're not doing the extra thing, you're not good enough. It's always, I need to do more. I need, you always constantly like this low grade guilt, more, 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 more. It's never enough. I'll tell you one last example of a culture like this. It's isolating. Because when you ever do find yourself in a space where you're really, really bad, and you're not in a good space spiritually, you think, I'm the only shameful person who's ever gone through this or ever been here, and I can never share that. How sad. How sad that sinners can't even come to church for help. Like, I say this a lot because I want to press it into our brains. Like, friends, Where can sinners go to find mercy and grace if not the church? Where are they going to go to find spiritual help if they can't come here? If they are afraid of being crushed and burdened because of the kind of culture we've built here, where else can they go? Seriously, think about it. Now, let's be a church so radically surprised by grace that it humbles us. That we lift our eyes and say, me, God, you chose me. You've given all this to me. I don't deserve anything. Everything I have is a gift. I deserve hell. And you've given me so much. Everything is just extra. Well, we're so surprised by grace that when a sinner comes to us and says, I'm burdened by this sin, we say, brother, I've been burdened by sin. And here is the Savior who's lifted it for you. Let's go together. Let's go together. <laughs> See, this culture of the Jews was filled with self-righteousness and judgmental in their hearts. And for this reason, Paul says, you guys are hard and impenitent in your heart, and you're storing up God's wrath for yourself. On the day of wrath, God's going to unleash judgment. And here's why. Verse 6, he will give everyone according to their works. God shows no partiality. God doesn't play favorites, whether you're, you're a Jew or a Gentile. Right? Back then, again, that's the religious sort of rebel. God's looking at what you do and saying, all right, you want to play by the game of trying to earn your way to God? Let's see your life. Do you do things perfectly? He even says that. Next, he starts giving out some qualifications. He says, all right, you want to try to earn your way to God by all your good works, by all of your ministry, by all of your service to God? All right, God's going to give you according to your works. Verse 7, he says, if you, if you do good, all right, fine. You'll get eternal life. But if you're self-seeking, you don't obey the truth, there will be tribulation and distress. He says, you want to play the game of trying to earn your way? Fine. Who measures up? And suddenly, most of us, I hope, think, well, not me. Not me. I don't. See, because the, the truth is, we are saved by works. It's just not our works. It's the work of Jesus, right? We are saved by works. It matters that you're holy. The thing is, you can never be that without Jesus. See, Jesus is the one who works for us on the cross, giving us a new label, a new status, and he's the one who works in us through the Spirit, giving us a new life. So certainly it matters how we live and who we are, but what I'm saying is the only way to get there is to see the crucified Savior for you, and that transforms you inside out. It is the work of Jesus that really transforms us, not our own works. And so finally at the end, Paul kind of just like, Climax is here at this argument. Look at verse 12. He says this, At the end of the day, all those who sin without the law will perish without the law. And all those who sin under law will be judged by the law. Here's what Paul's going to say right here. He's going to say, at the end of the day, everyone is inconsistent. If you grew up with the Bible or you didn't grow up with the Bible, grew up with the church, everyone is inconsistent to some degree, the Jew and the Gentile. And here's how he's going to say it. He's going to say, um, the Jews had God's law and they broke them. The Gentiles have a conscience, and they break it. That's what he says in verse uh, 14 there. He says, um, But when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law unto themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness. And their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On the final day, according to the gospel, God will judge the secrets of men. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, look it. it, it you want, let, let's go with God's law. Okay, so let's just play the game. All right, anyone want to play the game of how righteous you are? Let's play the game. Um, have you ever stolen something? Just even a small thing? Yeah, probably. Okay, what does that make us? It makes us liars. Okay. Um, have you ever uh, committed adultery? You're like, nah, I don't, I've never committed adultery. Well, Jesus says again, lust is adultery. 
You ever lusted, objectified someone, checked out someone who wasn't your spouse, went into fantasy world in your head, watched pornography, anything like that? Most of us probably go, oh, there's, yeah, at some point. Okay, so, so now, not only are we liars, but we're adulterers. Okay, um, you ever murdered anyone? Nope, I'm good on that one. Okay, again, Jesus says, if you have anger in your heart, then you committed the sin of, of murder. Okay, you ever been angry at someone? You're like, like now? Like, no, no, I mean like in general. Okay, yeah, it got me. Okay, cool. So lying, adulterous, murders, okay? Um, the Bible says that we are to love God and he should be our number one. And anyone want to say like, I've lived my whole life 100% for God, never a moment he wasn't on top. I, I didn't think so. Because um, I need to be doing the sin of lying again, right? Um, so like that's four out of 10. I, like you just, that's already a fail. Like you only, even if you get the rest of them, which I don't think you do. But like, it's pretty clear that we come up against God's law and every one of us is rendered a sinner. Every one of us. And so the Jews had those 10 commandments. They should have looked at them and gone, man, I'm broken because I've broken every one of those. But they looked at that law and they said, man, I'm good. Now, what about the people who didn't grow up with the Bible, who didn't grow up with the law, who didn't grow up in church, who didn't grow up being moral or taught right and wrong? Do they have a way out? Can they just say, I didn't know the 10 commandments. I, I, Paul would say, no, you got a law. It's your own law. Church, here's the craziest thing to me, man. It's not just that we can't obey God's law. Like, that's bad enough. We can't even obey the laws we make up ourselves. That's how broken our sin condition is. You get up and walk out. Someone sits down in your seat. You're like, hey, that was my seat. You, uh, that's, you just made that rule up, bro. Like, that's not in the Ten Commandments. You know what I'm saying? You made that one. Hey, that's my seat. I was sitting there. I, got, I said I'm sitting here. Like, what do we have these weird culture, right? And then this dude gets up and goes to the restroom. And you're like, okay, I just take his. You just break your own law. You just told him not to do it. And then you're doing it. And then he comes back and goes, that was my seat. And like, he took my seat. Like, what, how, why, why do we break the laws we just made up? Why? Because we're inconsistent. It's the condition of our hearts that even though when we make the when when we cook the game for our own benefit and look at our lives, we're like, yo, my track record is still trash. So one pastor puts it this way: suppose you found out when you died and went to heaven that God put a, a, a tape recorder around your neck, it was invisible, and you had it around your neck your whole life. And you come before God, and God says, I want to show you that you actually are a sinner. And you're like, okay. So he pulls out the tape recorder, presses play, and it's you. It's you in fourth grade. And it's you saying, you really shouldn't cheat on your test, right? And then he goes, let's uh, exhibit A. He shows you a screen there, and it's you in college. And you're looking over at your neighbors, right? You're looking over at someone, and you're doing what you said you shouldn't do. Strike one. And then um, maybe it's you talking to your little brother, and you're like, dude, don't be so rude to mom. What's your problem? Right? And then he says, all right, exhibit A. And it's you 10 minutes later being rude to mom. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you didn't even last 10 minutes with that one. And then it's, it's you telling your kids, you really shouldn't curse. That's a bad word. And then it just shows you on the eight in traffic. And then, you know, case closed, right? We don't even follow the laws we make up. That's because one of the clearest ways to show our sinfulness is our inconsistency. Yes, against God's law, but even our own laws. So, so, if God is going to judge the radical rebel who doesn't have a law, but they break their own conscience, and God is going to judge the moral religious person who outwardly performs but inwardly is far from God and is judgmental and hypocritical, what hope do we have if every one of us falls maybe in both or one or two of those categories? Lift your eyes, church. The good news is there was one who came who perfectly obeyed the law. He didn't sin once, 100%. Obeyed God's law, obeyed his internal conscience, 100%. And he was crucified. He was put on a cross. And on the cross, every ounce of God's righteous wrath was put on him. He absorbed the judgment of God. For hours, he drank from that cup and even looked up and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in that act, he became the one who, though he perfectly obeyed the law, he bore the curse of God's wrath 
so that sinners like you and I who are inconsistent against God's law and our own law might find the one true hope, Jesus Christ himself. The one who loves sinners, who comes to ally those who cannot do anything but be broken before a holy God. He comes to forgive us. And so, when you come to acknowledge your judgmental spirit in any capacity, and you find the brokenness in your heart, Jesus rises to forgive you and to begin a process of transforming you. And this is the good news. That though we are sinners, God loves sinners. and He sent his son to die for them. And he sent his son to make us more consistent with his law. It's by his grace we are saved. And that changes everything.